So there's tons of ways that you can scan film at home, and it's a topic that can become extremely complicated, especially when you piss off the wrong person in an analog photography forum online. So anyway, there's a lot of debate as to what the best method for scanning film at home is. You know, do I need this piece of equipment or that piece of equipment? Do I use this technique or that technique? And in this video, I'm not going to be going over every single technique, but I will be going over the ones that I personally use. And I hope that it could help even just a little bit. If anything, I hope I can at least help ease your mind if you were just yelled at across 25 paragraphs in an analog photography forum. I'm not speaking from personal experience, I'm just saying. Sometimes I'll send my film out to be processed at a lab, and when I send it out, I'll usually opt in for high resolution scans to be sent to me via email. And those are usually perfectly fine files to work with. But when I get the film back, sometimes I like to do some extra scans of some of the frames at home. Why? Because. So one option for scanning, and probably one of the most commonly referenced, at least when talking about scanners, is the Epson V600 scanner. The V600 is a somewhat reasonably priced scanner, which will yield good results, though I don't personally find myself using it very often. If anything, I'll use it for some black and white, but it really starts to fall apart when you start dealing with color negatives, unless you want to like really mess with the file quite a bit. I've definitely got some good results from the Epson scanner, but Overall, I personally prefer scanning with my camera. Yep, you heard that right. I take photos on film, wait to process that film, then I take photos of those photos with my digital camera that cost me significantly more money than the Epson V600. Granted, I do use my digital camera in a lot of other situations, including a lot of client work. So how exactly do I go about scanning my negatives with my digital camera, since I'm pretty sure that's most of the reason that you're here. So after processing my film or getting it processed at a lab like Dwayne's, I'll cut the negatives to fit into the crappy negative holder that came with the Epson V600. Okay, there's really not that much wrong with it. Okay, well, there definitely is, but so far it's worked for me, so I really haven't seen the need to go out and get something fancier like the Digitalize a film holder. I'd imagine that's far better, but it's really just not in my budget at the moment, so... Also, you can forget copy stands like a lot of other people might use, because I'm super cheap. And this is probably about that point where I'll really piss off those people in the analog photography forum. Anyway, I use this. It's a simple plastic flower pot I got for less than a dollar, and I cut a hole into the bottom big enough for my 50mm macro lens to extend through when focusing. I painted the inside with a matte black paint so it minimizes the possibility of reflection onto the negative, and it seems to work completely fine. Another thing that's really going to piss people off is that I don't often use gloves when handling my negatives. I'm just careful and I handle them by the edges. If I feel the need to use gloves, I'll use them, but it's just an extra step I don't personally care to take. That doesn't mean you shouldn't wear gloves though. You probably should. I probably should. But... So as far as lighting goes, I use a Kaiser Slim Light panel, and it works really well most of the time. The only time I ever see any real issue is when dealing with large areas of flat blue skies, which can sometimes be within the negative itself, but I think more recently I've noticed the panel itself just isn't functioning as well as it was before. I might just be crazy, but I don't think it ever gave me these problems before. It was a good budget panel for a while though. This may be one of the things that I will be upgrading. So what I'll do is I'll start by elevating the film in the holder about seven and a half inches above the light using these SpongeBob DVD cases. This is definitely seven and a half inches. I'm sure of it. I'm sure of it. So I'll start by carefully putting my negatives into the negative holder and putting the negative holder on top of the DVD cases. I elevate the film just to get rid of any possibility of there being any scratches or dust on the light table itself appearing in the film. This helps me focus purely on the film. I almost always use an aperture of 8 when I'm shooting negatives. I personally don't mind using my 50mm macro lens, but I know some people like to use a longer macro lens and put it on a copy stand. But like I said, this flower pot works fine for me, so 
I'll set my focus to the entire focus area using all the different focus points that my camera has. And the autofocus usually picks up really well on the film. I'm using a Sony a7R 3 and a Sony 50mm macro in this case. My white balance is normally set to auto, and when I set my exposure, I at least try to make sure that there is somewhat of a peak right around the middle on the histogram. I know people will argue up and down about this, you know, your exposure should be set this way or that way, but so far this has worked totally fine for me. Once you have the peak right in the middle, I like to expose a little bit more so that it just bumps a little bit to the right, as centered as possible, and then just nudge it a little bit to the right. This has yielded great results every time I've done it. If there's a better way to do it, I'm totally open to learn, but so far this has worked for me. So as you can see, it's pretty much worked fine for me this whole time, so... In all, my setup for this probably cost me just over $100, with most of the cost of that being for the light panel itself. Sure, there are plenty of better, more pricey setups that you can get. And if you have the budget, then I say go for it. If you have the budget and you want to spend it on it, I don't see any problem with that. I would love to upgrade at some point soon, but for now this has worked for me and I just don't see any need to upgrade until I really can't take it anymore and I find the need to upgrade. Do whatever you're going to do. The world is your oyster, whatever that saying is. That sounds stupid. The world is your oyster. Is that, is that even a saying or is that from Spongebob? God, I'm 32 years old. So now I'll bring these into Lightroom and I'll start turning these negatives into positives. To do this, I use a plugin called Negative Lab Pro, but you can do this manually in Photoshop, although I don't personally know how to, so I'm not going to go over that. I've only used Negative Lab Pro, and before that I was using the Epson V600, but I just felt the Epson V600 didn't do well enough for color scans. So here I am doing this with my camera. Now usually what I would do to start this process is I would press W or I would grab my white balance tool over here just by clicking on it. And I would white balance off of one of these, uh, one of these sections between frames on the negative itself. In this case though, I'm not going to do that. So I shot these on Lamography's Metropolis film and I metered for a sensitivity of 200. And what I've found personally is that the Metropolis film looks better when I don't use the white balance tool. So what I'll start by doing in this case is I'll just press R to bring up my crop tool. I'll make sure everything is straight and framed up nicely here. And I know some people are probably gonna yell at me because I didn't fill a ton of the frame with this negative. And yes, I could have, but you know, using 42 megapixels, I just, don't see it being super necessary. It's a big enough file for anything that I care to do with it right now. So anyway, I'll crop it in, I'll make sure everything's good. And then what I'll do is I will go up here to File, Plugin Extras, and I'll go to Negative Lab Pro. Now this will bring up the settings that I've already applied because I already converted this. So you'll see I boosted the darks a little bit, I boosted the whites, I dropped the contrast a bit, and um, the white balance is just auto as it was. And down here I have it checked to make a copy, and what this does is it makes a positive copy of the image, so that after you do this, you can further edit it in Lightroom. If you don't do this, you're going to be editing on the raw file here, and everything's going to be backwards, and nothing's going to line up the way that it should. So you want to make sure that you have make a copy checked if you're looking to edit it afterwards. So I'll do that and then I'll simply just apply it unless I want to add any um, adjustments to the highlights, the midtones, or the shadows. In this case I didn't, I just like the way that Metropolis looks and I'll just apply it there. Of course I'll go through and I'll do the exact same thing for any of these other photos, which you see I've already done here. Uh, this one's the original color output that it had. Um, I did some adjustment to the highlights on this one. I did a slight adjustment on this one. I'll usually create virtual copies and I'll do various edits that I think I like. I say I think I like because then I'll come back to it 30 minutes later and realize that I don't like it at all. But yeah, that's the general bit of how I go about doing this. And it's just a completely 
repeated process between all of them. I could make a more in-depth video about every little bit of this, but that's the general bit of what I do. If you have any other techniques that work well for you, feel free to comment them below or feel free to comment below about how terrible this video was and how terrible I am because I know this is YouTube and that's probably gonna happen, so.